Hey, welcome back to Geology 101 with Jeff Simpson, but not with Jeff Simpson. Tonight it will be Professor Robinson, Don Robinson. Be nice to him. Uh, he is going to play my lecture and then pause it when he feels like it, point out where I'm wrong every few seconds, and uh, then answer your questions. Feel free to ask questions. This would be kind of like the lecture I would give if I were there. Uh, we'll do the best we can, and uh, I will see you in the live assuming my plane makes it across the Pacific, next Tuesday, in five days from now. Even though I am really recording this three weeks ahead of time. Oh, man, if you're OCD like me, this little space is bugging the heck out of you right now, too. Oh, well, life goes on. No, it doesn't. This chapter is called Atoms to Minerals. I will assume that most of you remember your high school chemistry. Again, this is me. I'm still sitting here on the floor with this cute little kid. Usually I'll start off a video or I'll start off the lecture with some fun videos. I'll start about 5.50, maybe 5.55, have a few introductory videos, and then start class right at 6. So you want to be here right away or early so you don't miss the fun. This is really cool. The guy plant, head plants right into that snowbank. But you can't see it, so there. Um, I also like weird things, so you'll find these in the middle of the lecture. Again, it's probably best to take notes with pencil and paper. I didn't believe it for a long time, but I did suspect it. Okay, remember, everything you need geology-related is on softpath.org. This is the lesson of geology. If nothing else, you have to remember this. If we don't grow it, we mine it. Everything around you is either grown or mined. I don't know that this really had much to do with geology, but I pulled it out. You can question the source of this, the Mineral Information Institute, but it is true that every person in the world uses an incredible amount of geology. You might think you're never going to drink that much Dr. Pepper in your life to use that much aluminum, but consider the fact that part of the roads, part of the buildings, part of the infrastructure, part of the planes, everything that we build is partly for you. I thought it was for me, but apparently not. This is what mining looks like. You mine, you have tailings basins, tailings basins, but you get money out of the deal, so it's a good deal. Tonight's lecture brought to you by 20 Mule P Team Borax, otherwise known as this, sodium tetraborate. Again, I showed you the objectives for this chapter last Tuesday, but assuming that my VPN is working, I will show them to you again. Uh, this is what it's like logging in from China through a double VPN and in a really slow hotel, which brags about its good Wi-Fi, by the way. Oh no, this is a PDF. We'll come back to the objectives. For those of you with a memory, unlike me, uh, remember that we did go through the objectives very slowly and painfully on Tuesday in the syllabus orientation. Can't believe I remembered that. Okay, your standard atom through Bohr, through Dalton, through everything. You've got the internal nucleus featuring the protons and the neutrons. Electrons are in the shells. This is the model we work with. It may not be accurate, but it seems to work for most of the things we're doing. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons. Those protons are in the nucleus. The atomic mass is equal to the protons plus the neutrons. Uh, protons are usually equal to neutrons in smaller atoms, but as we get bigger, the number of neutrons gets larger, a lot like when you get older. You had muscle, you had a little bit of fat, but as you get older, your fat gets a little bit more. Uh, the number of protons determines what the atom's name is and, in a way, what its characteristics will be. It's like the father's name in America, but not necessarily in China. Uh, my father's name Simpson. I'm Simpson. I behave like a Simpson, which both has good and bad characteristics. Um, however, the number of protons does determine the number of electrons, and the electrons determine how the atom behaves chemically. You add more 
electrons, it behaves slightly differently. You take away electrons, it behaves differently. Uh, the mass number is just the fat of the atom. You add too much mass and it becomes unstable. It emits alpha, beta, or gamma. The first two particles, the last one, radiation. Uh, upsetting radios, which is why we call that radioactivity. The most common elements in Earth's crust. If you're thinking about this, what would you think would be the most common elements in Earth's crust? I think before I started studying geology, I'd think uh, maybe iron. Rockite. It's not a mineral, but I just made it up. Actually, I had no idea. It is kind of crazy what the Earth is mostly made out of. Which of these would you suspect? You can pause. You can guess. But unless you read your chapter or watched the video, you're not going to get it. Number one, and number one by far, oxygen is the most common element in the Earth's crust. When I say by far, how much? Take a look. These are the elements in Earth's crust. Oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, and then we go over to the halides on the left side of the chart. For those of you who like pie charts, oh, pie. Oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, magnesium, calcium, potassium, and sodium, and then everything else. Crazy. We used to think aluminum was very rare in the 18 or late 1800s, early 1900s. I think at the Chicago World's Fair, there was a large sphere of aluminum. It was deemed so precious that they had security guards surrounding it. We didn't know how to isolate aluminum very well. It's 8% of Earth's crust. Now we put it into cans and we throw the cans away. For those of you who like tables, here you go again. This is the percentage of elements in Earth's crust by weight and by volume. It gets kind of crazy by volume. How can this be the case? Oxygen takes up a lot of space. Silicon, a lot more compact. Percentage of atoms, that's probably a better way to do it. 60% for oxygen, 20% for silicon, aluminum, iron. By the time you get to here, you are almost up to 90%. Molecules. Molecules are made out of atoms that are joined. Some molecules look like Kermit the Frog, but not all of them. This is hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron. It tends to lose its electron because it doesn't hang on to it very tightly. Oxygen will steal it, making oxygen slightly negative, the hydrogen in slightly positive, which means this molecule has poles, positive and negative, and it explains a lot about the way that oxygen behaves in terms of surface tension, in terms of dissolvability, freezing, and a lot of other things. Here is a molecule of salt. Sodium loses its electron. Chlorine steals it. But unlike this molecule in which the electron is shared, sometimes the electron is here, a little bit of time it's there, Chlorine pretty much just steals sodium's electron. Chlorine becoming a negative ion, sodium becoming a positive ion. This is ionic bond, this is a covalent bond, you studied that in high school. When this continues on, you end up getting things like, well, salt crystals. They stack up a certain way, and that is reflected on the macro scale. If you ever look at salt from your shaker on the table through a lens, you'll notice this kind of structure. The most common molecule, or one of the most common molecules in geology, is the silica tetrahedron, in which there are four silicons and one oxygen that join together to make this almost pyramid-like thing. Imagine a pyramid, but with only three corners instead of four. Oops, that's it. We're not going to talk about it much. You go into mineralogy class, you'll talk about it a lot. Let's talk about bonds really quickly. We just did this. In water, it's a covalent bond. The two electrons, sorry, the electron from hydrogen spend most of, most of its time around oxygen. Sometimes they'll go around hydrogen, but in general, this becomes positive. This end becomes negative. This is a covalent bond. Why? The outside electrons are called valence electrons. The electrons are shared, so they're cooperative. It is a covalent bond. When you steal electrons, as in salt, you take a metal like sodium, which will burn. You take a poisonous green gas, which is chlorine, 
you combine them to make a molecule and you get sodium chloride which we dump on our popcorn and eat in, eat in copious amounts. It's weird. Think about this. Oxygen supports fire. Hydrogen was in the Hindenburg. It burns. We now use water to put out fire. A molecule behaves differently from the atoms that form it in most cases. Covalent bond, ionic bond, and metallic bond. Metallic bond Electrons just glide fairly easily from one atom to the next. They aren't necessarily tied to one group. And then, of course, for those of you who are movie fans, there is this bond. Isotopes. An atom can gain or lose neutrons. Doesn't change what the atom is. In this case, this is hydrogen because it has one proton. We won't be dealing with this a lot in 101. Because you probably forgot, here's that same thing again. But in a different way. These are the most common minerals. Plagioclase feldspars are 39% of Earth. You'll find out what these are in just a while. Potassium feldspars, otherwise known as K feldspars, are about 12% of Earth. Quartz, 12%. Pyroxenes, 11%, amphiboles, 5%, micas, 5%. You add this together, and these few minerals make up 84% of Earth's crust. Being as I'm just kind of a difficult guy, I'm going to make you memorize about 20 minerals. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. When we really could get by with 6. That oh, keeps me in a job. Here are the formulas for some of the most common minerals. Quartz is SiO2. The three most common feldspars, potassium feldspar, sodium feldspar, calcium feldspar. Mica, whoa, there are two different types of mica, and I should have put them both here, and pyroxene. We won't see a lot of pyroxene in our labs. Here are silica tetrahedrons. Again, you don't need to know much about them, but you should know they explain the way minerals tend to fall apart. These guys will make sheets. These sheets then bond to water. Water makes this sheet. Forget about this sheet. And you end up with feldspars creating things like clays. Rocks fall apart. Remember how I told you I don't remember things very well? Well, this is a picture I put in here for a good reason. I have no idea what the reason was. But I still like the picture. And I still like minerals. This is just the cutest little picture. What's the difference between a rock and a mineral? Well, I probably shouldn't have put this picture here, but we can start here. This is the lab that you guys just did. You looked at granite and you found out that it contained these guys. Potassium feldspar, sodium feldspar, biotite mica, quartz. You might have had muscovite mica in there. I'm not sure. That is an example of a rock versus a mineral. Here. Here are minerals, and they can go into different rocks in the same way that a cake is made of flour and sugar, eggs, raisins, prunes. I know. Rocks are made of minerals. These guys are the pure substances. These guys are the mixtures. What is a mineral? Good place to start. In order to be a mineral, something must be solid. You are out. Although you're solid stand-up people, except for you in the back messing on your phone, um, you can't be a mineral. It has to be inorganic, which sadly wipes out all of you. Even if you're dead, if you've expired during the first few minutes of this lecture, you still are considered organic because you were once alive. <sighs> it has to occur naturally. Wipes out some of my neighbors in Scottsdale. Um, and it has to have a crystalline structure, which means the molecules or atoms in the sample have to repeat themselves over and over. And it has to have some kind of definite chemical composition, allowing us to establish a chemical formula. It just can't be some namby-pamby, wily little thing that wanders around. We have to have a chemical formula for it. Here are some definite chemical compositions. Halite, which you guys call salt, NaCl, potassium feldspar, KAL, Si3O8, quartz, SiO2, two native uh, elements, 
gold and copper. And then, of course, Simpsonite, which is, uh, oh, never mind. Is this a mineral? It's ice. Let's go back and look. Check. 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 Believe it or not, ice, at least by some people, can be considered a mineral. Guys, when you get engaged, just think about it. You could save a lot of money. You'll have to live in a cold house, but it's just an idea. I put it out there for free. Let me know how it works. Can this be considered a mineral? Obviously, no. It is not solid. Diamond? Diamond in the rock can be considered mineral. I guess if we polish it, we still can consider it a mineral, although most diamonds, by the way, now are synthetic. And obviously this is man-made, so it can't be a mineral. How many minerals are there? There are more than 4,000 at latest count. I think the movie that you watched said 2,000, but that was 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Um, the good news is you're only going to have to memorize about 200 of them. Just kidding. You're going to need to dope only 20 or so what are called the rock forming minerals and the process really will will be easy we will cover it in two labs I will show you so many pictures the following minerals are pretty but they're not rock forming they're not even pretty they're just artwork this is the chemical composition of many gemstones you're gonna notice something tends to repeat itself in here s i s i s i s i Ah, S, I, S, I, and oxygen, three of them, oxygen, three times six, 18 of them, oxygen, three times six, 18, oxygen, four times three, you get the idea. A lot of minerals are what we call silicates, combinations of silicon and oxygen. One of your first labs will be to count the percentage of silica in a mineral. Now, there are classes or families of minerals. They're fairly easy. The one I just talked about, silicates. They have silicon and oxygen. They make over 90% of Earth's crust. Quartz, SiO2, feldspars, three different kinds. Notice they all have similar structures in them. An olivine can either have this or this combined with an SiO4. Quartz, feldspar, and olivine from page 609 of the, I think, 11th edition of your text. Sand is mostly quartz. Let's see if this will work. While it's coming up, remember, these are the objectives. They are linked from right here on each chapter. We don't need this, though. I'm not sure that this is going to come up. So... I will put it in the background. We'll go back to the lecture and come back in a bit. Probably should have brought that up first. Sand is mostly quartz. Why? Quartz is one of the hardest minerals. Uh, you know that it's very common. The other minerals that are really common are much softer, so that when all these minerals come to the surface, they go out to a beach, they get washed back and forth. One quartz being the hardest, sticks around. Also, the other minerals form in places that aren't anything like the surface of the earth. Therefore, when they come to the surface of the earth, the conditions here are kind of irritating to them. They wear down. They break apart. Quartz is a fairly low temperature mineral in its formation, so it tends to be more durable on the surface of the earth. Here are some more silicates. Kyanite. I don't think I've ever collected any of this. It's an aluminum silicate. Euclase, barrel, aluminum, silica, attached to this. Wait, I put it in there twice? I guess I like it. Here is quartz, and this is quartz that's stained. Obviously, we call it mangane oh, sorry, amethyst. There is a big mine for this up at Four Peaks. It used to be guarded by a guy, and you had to go up there by helicopter. I was talking to somebody who had been up there by helicopter. That would be a good field trip. Here is quartz in the form of amethyst. And this is probably the most common mineral under the crust. 
It is known as perovskite, and there's great hope for it being utilized in solar panels. But again, because it forms deep under the crust, when you bring it to the crust, kind of like one of those fish from the bottom of the ocean, brought up to the surface, it may not do well unless we isolate it from the elements. Let's see how our ah, video is doing. Um, YouTube, since it's run by Google, is not real popular here in China. I'm recording this from the hotel, which means we're blocked. Other mineral families. The biggest one was the silicates. The second biggest one, the carbonates. They contain C and O, carbon and oxygen. Three fairly common carbonates are calcite, this, aragonite, and dolomite. And a Canadian penny. More mineral families. Sulfides, which contain sulfur, and sulfates, which contain an SO4. Um, we have pyrite, iron sulfide, otherwise it's known as fool's gold. Calcopyrite, which is kind of like fool's gold, but also contains Cu, which is copper. Gypsum, which is a calcium sulfate. This is a cool picture, especially when you realize that is a guy standing on a single crystal of gypsum in a cave in Mexico. And here's gypsum again in a form that you will probably hold someday. There are the halides. These include things from the left side of the periodic table and things from the right side of the peri periodic table. Um, halide comes from the Greek word alati, A-L-A-T-I, which we turn into word S-A-L-T, salt. I used to have this on my dining table when I lived in Athens. These tend to form in evapor evaporative settings such as salt lakes, landlocked seas. Uh, think of the Dead Sea, the Great Salt Lake. Here are some halides. They can be minerals. Yes, we eat minerals. Here are some of the mineral families again, just summarized for you. There are the native elements, things that are just elements and appear as minerals. We have gold, copper, carbon, and Carbon. Wait, this is carbon coming in two different forms, many forms, diamond and graphite. Some of you are using graphite right now to write your notes. Here's galena. It's a sulfide, PBS. It is incredibly dense. Well, compared with the other things, you'll see densities in just a while. A cool thing about Galena. I don't think this is going to work either. Let's see. Uh, in the Arabic world a long time ago, you would take galena, let it oxidize, put it on your eyes, and people thought it made women beautiful. What they didn't know was they were getting lead into their bodies. Theta Bera from Hollywood used to use this black stuff around her eyes. I'm not sure if it affected her health or not. We now use lead in batteries, shot, things like that. This is a uh, video of a mine in England where they were mining lead and now it's collapsing. The guy is losing his farm field. One of the things that we thought for years was that lead levels in ancient Rome were high and that may have caused the demise of the Roman Empire. may have helped, but it probably wasn't toxic. This is an interesting thing. Uh, I'll talk to you about this when I get back, but we were convinced in the 19, I think it was 20s or 30s, that we definitely needed to put lead in gasoline, so we started doing it. Uh, a few decades later, somebody realized when they were checking out lead in soil, wait, we're getting lead hundreds of times bigger than it should be. This is not good. They couldn't figure out where it was come from, coming from. They realized the lead in the gasoline was polluting the entire surface of the earth, but at least somebody made money off the deal, so it's good. Um, we took lead out of gasoline. We were warned that it would be expensive. People would stop using gasoline. People would stop driving cars. Guess what? None of that came true. We're still driving more than ever, although we're up to 25.4 miles per gallon as a corporate average for passenger vehicles. But what's interesting is lead hurts the brain. It prevents full development. Since we took lead out of gasoline, 
lead in the environment has started to decrease significantly. It could be correlation or it could be causation. We don't know. But from 2000 to 2014, the average age of a homicide victim climbed from 30 to 34 years. Why? One of the theories is that those who have the most damage to their brains are getting older. Obviously, not everybody. Otherwise, that would have climbed by 14 years. And the total number of victims going down. We may have poisoned ourselves into a social problem. But again, we made money, so everything's good. Well, somebody made money. Uh, note on ductility and malle malleability. This really should be later in the lecture, and I think it is, but I'll talk about it right here. Metals are ductile. Because they have the metallic bond with the electrons being shared, you can pull them apart until they make very thin wires. You may read in comic books somewhere you can take an ounce of gold and stretch it into a wire that go that'll go from here to the moon and back or something like that. It's true, which is why you can have a gold wing for ring for sale at Parking Swap for five dollars because there's very little gold on it. This process is called ductility, pulling things apart. I just think of pulling a duck's neck, and that reminds me of it. What is this all about? Another word for a hammer is a mallet. Take a hammer and pound on a penny, and you can well do this. Many of us have spent 50 cents to smash our one penny coin. Some of us have done this. I don't think I ever have. I was always afraid to derail a train. My dad was a railroad engineer. And I did not want to get in trouble. This is from your book. You can look at it there. We've already talked about it. Here are some pretty pictures. You can't have too many pretty pictures. How do minerals form? Well, one, you take a molten material, you cool it, it solidifies. As it solidifies, different atoms, different molecules tend to isolate themselves and gather together in the same way that if you put a bunch of people into a classroom, like you guys, people that like each other tend to get together in the groups. Minerals do the same thing. If you have minerals that are dissolved in water and the water evaporates, the minerals are left behind, usually in different layers, depending on the solubility of the mineral. And another thing, you can dump two different liquids into one big bowl. The liquids each contain a different element or a different molecule. Those molecules can combine, switch ions, and then one of the new molecules may drop to the bottom. Here is an example of evaporation. If you've ever left in Arizona some salt out on your counter at night and come back the next morning, sorry, salt, salt water on your counter at night and come back the next morning, you might have noticed crystals on your counter. They are beautiful. It's really cool to look at. We should do this in class next week. Here's an example of solidification. When you have molten material and it cools, you get minerals forming. However, with lava, it cools so quickly, the minerals don't have time to separate. You end up with this matrix, in this case, basalt. And some minerals precipitate, in this case, around your heating element in a water heater, or this might be precipitation in a copper smelter where they're trying to purify copper. I'm not sure. I steal pictures from all over. Um, here is a quartz vein. It's an example of one of the last minerals to settle out when molten stuff is on its way to the surface of the earth and solidifies. Again, quartz tends to solidify at a fairly low temperature, so it gets closer to the earth's surface than almost any other mineral before it turns into a solid. And because of that, it tends to be very stable at Earth's surface. The hammer is in there for size reference. How do you know what mineral you have? Well, right now, they may all look like number threes to you. That won't help. But usually, you start looking at the characteristics. Uh, tall, short, color, bald, hairy. Hairy doesn't work very well with minerals. Although hairy is the name of my department chair, it doesn't apply here. First, let's look at color. It works well with some minerals. Azurite is always blue, which kind of makes sense when you consider this. Azul in Spanish, azure, blue. Malachite, from malo in Greek, meaning green. Sulfur, always yellow. Olivine, kind of an olive green color, also known as peridot. Gold is gold, lapis lazuli, not really a mineral, but it is always that kind of blue, or usually that kind of blue. 
Here is gold. I have a little bottle of this. I'll try to remember to show you. You can buy this for six or eight dollars at various sites. Uh, good news is we used to use cyanide to extract gold and it looks like cornstarch can be used to do that too. There is a place north of Key Freak that I ran into a few years ago. I was exploring around. It was an old gold mine. The guy was just dumping his old cyanide into Cave Creek and people were drinking the water down below. Who knows what was going on? I went up there. He was upset with me being there. We discussed it for a while. I took off. Malachite is usually green again. Azurite, blue. Um, lots of numbers and abbreviations. We don't really care. Don't memorize these unless you want to. Malachite, azurite, chalcopyrite, and chrysocolla. These are fairly reliable. I just thought this was cool, so I put it in there. I think a square foot of this will probably cost you about $1.44 and a lot of work. And if one of these got out of line, it would just drive me crazy. We make that stuff, copper, into this. Sulfur, always yellow. By the way, here are pictures of sulfur. This one is from your textbook. This one is a guy in Indonesia digging it out of a volcano. It was called brimstone. In the Old Testament, they talked about brimstone. This is what they're talking about. It's around the brim of volcanoes. It was the smell of hell, or Hades, to the Greeks. There it is. Here it is in the country where I am. Interestingly enough, this picture from your book is the same as this picture. I was at the Geological Society of America conference in Vancouver, Vancouver two, two Octobers ago, and I took this picture, and then I looked really closely and realized, wait, wait, what is that? It looks like that. So I zoomed in with my camera, and lo and behold, it's that weird. This is a huge pile. I think you know that a person would stand maybe about that tall. This is the world's largest gold crystal that's been found, single crystal. I did not find it, unfortunately. Here is gold on quartz. Somebody found a big gold nugget, 6.07 pounds. I just ran into it. Here is cinnabar. Neat thing about cinnabar, it is the ore for mercury. You grind this stuff up, you heat it up in the presence of charcoal, you gather the fumes, you precipitate or extract the fumes, you cool them down and you get them back, and lo and behold, you have created the moonshine variety of mercury, liquid mercury. We used to do that right here in Dreamy Draw Park. There were people who went up to those mountains back in the 40s, even into the 50s. Oops. And they would grind the stuff up. They would get the mercury. They would bring it down to Phoenix. And after messing with it all day, their brains would be kind of gone. They were kind of dreamy, which is why this area is called Dreamy Draw. Those of you from Phoenix know that there's a school up here named after this. Mercury Mine School is right there. There's a street in this area named Cinnabar. The old purification plant for the mercury mines is right along 16th Street, I think it is, right about here. Thankfully, we kind of covered it up and then put some really nice houses on it. No problem. It doesn't affect, mercury doesn't affect only humans. Zebra finches go mad with mercury, too. And we also used mercury in the mining of gold. It's a, it's a nice way to dissolve gold. Uh, those of you with amalgams containing mercury and gold know this. Sadly, we left the mercury in the streams. It should last for another, what is that, 100 centuries? Yeah. Go humans. Here are some of the metals that we need in our modern society. And this is supply risk versus environmental applications. You can look at that later if you want. I'll keep moving. Um, color isn't always reliable. Why? These are all quartz. The same mineral can be many different colors. Here is quartz again. Many different colors. Here is fluorite. Fluorite can appear in many different colors. Also, different minerals can have the same color. 
You can't say, I found a white mineral, therefore it must be albite. No, it could be any number of things. With 4,000 minerals, there are a lot of white minerals, a lot of yellow ones. Example of yellow, it's not always sulfur. Casolite, which is a lead uranium oxide with a silicate attached. Beautiful, but I wouldn't hang around it. Also yellow. Beryl, in this form, emerald, also green. It's not always malachite. Halite can be white slash clear. By the way, this is how you guys use halite. Some of you use it on margaritas, but this is where most of it goes. Those people back east, they do this kind of thing. More pictures of halite. I have no idea why I put these in here. Here's halite underground. It tends to create domes, and because it's less dense, it tends to rise. We drill, drill, we drill down into it. We inject water, we bring the water back up, we evaporate the water, and then we put it in the pack, the evaporate into packages and sell it. Here are some minerals recognized by color, but not always. This is out of the Mineral Museum at the Colorado School of Mines up at Golden. Great little place to go to school if you want to study geology. So if we don't use color, what else can we use? Well, here's a hint. Streak. I have no idea from what movie this is. What is streak? Streak is the color of a mineral's powder. You take an unglazed porcelain plate, you rub the mineral across it, it will leave a colored streak on there if it's softer than the unglazed plate. This is a problem because many of the silicates tend to be harder than the plate, so you can't do that. In general, things that are metals tend to have a dark streak. Non-metals tend to have a light streak. You would think that the streak would always be the same color as the mineral, but it's not. Cinnabar does that. Pyrite does that. Hematite looks black, but it leaves a reddish brown streak. Here are minerals and their streaks. Surprisingly, or not, graphite has a streak that looks an awful lot like pencil. Graphite feels the way it does because the carbon lines up in little sheets like this and they peel off. You might remember back to elementary school when you would color your fingers with graphite and then feel it. It was really slick. Those are the little carbon chains that you're messing with. If color doesn't work, if street doesn't work, we can look at luster. Luster can be divided into two types. Metallic, looks like a metal, usually gold or silver or non-metallic. Non-metallic can be glassy, otherwise known as vitreous. It can be rosinous. I don't know if that's really rosinous. It can be pearly, looking like a pearl. It can be rosinous. Again, I stuck that in there twice. And it can be this, known as dull, earthy, also known as known, and also, also known as geology lecture. Uh, what would you call this one? First, would it be metallic? Probably not. Non-metallic. Is it glassy, rosinous, pearly, or dull? I'll leave it to you guys. You can discuss it. Next, hardness. Hardness is not smashability of the mineral. It's the mineral's resistance to being scratched. Here is Mohs scale of hardness. I accidentally left that in there and it's become nostalgic for me. Here are the Vickers units, which are in kilograms per square millimeter. You don't need to know that. And here are the 10 minerals in Mohs scale, going from 1 through 10. Talc, gypsum, calcite, fluorite, apatite, feldspar, quartz, topaz, corundum, and diamond. Notice the delta or the differences in hardness between each of these minerals. They're not consistent. There's a big jump as you get toward the end. Also, we use some common tools to determine hardness. Fingernail, copper coin, knife blade, and window glass. This always bugged me when I first started learning about this. Knife blade is softer than window glass. Don't believe me? Take out your knife blades at home and try cutting your vegetables on a glass cutting board. You'll find your knives dull a lot quicker more quickly than they do on wood. Here's a, I don't know who thought about making cutting boards out of glass. Bad idea. 
steel file can be a little bit harder because it contains, contains more than just steel. Let's have a better picture of this. Here is the Mohs hardness scale. Top, gypsum, calcite, fluorite, apatite, orthoclate, whoa, feldspar, quartz, topaz, corundum, and diamond. Hardness of your fingernail, about two and a half. Penny, about three and a half. Glass, about five and a half. A knife, about seven. Steel nail, probably about a five. The way I remember the Mohs scale, T, G, C, F, A, feldspar, F, Q, T, C, D. The gray carpet faded and Frank questioned the carpet's durability. There's a question on the study sheet. Wait, it's on the film review. No, it's on the lecture notes. It's somewhere. That asks you to come up with your own 10-word sentence, a mnemonic, to help you remember most skill of hardness, just because it's something geology professors like to do to students. Yeah, here's the German version of, no, that's Norwegian. Well, here's a hardness kit with talc through diamond, and here's some hardness points, which we use to determine hardness of minerals. I used to have a set of these. They disappeared. Just because I like to have a lot of the same picture, here is the same thing again. This is Friedrich Mohs, good-looking dude, came up with a scale a long time ago, and we're still using it two centuries later. Here are some minerals in the hardness scale. Talc. It's a magnesium silicate. Looks like this in the raw. You guys recognized it in your first weeks of life as something like this. It went on your bum. We use it in making paper, paint, plastic, coatings, rubber, food, ceramic, uh, cosmetics, electric cables, pharmaceuticals. If it gets compressed in metamorphism, it can become harder. Soapstone is a rock with 30 to 80 percent talc in it. These countertops are soapstone. I would love to have these. They are beautiful. This is a Japanese sculpture. And it's kind of falling apart like Venus de Milo. And some of you are seeing this recently. Soapstone. This thing is huge. Oh, my grandma, OMG. This is where you saw talc early in your life. Since there are concerns about the health, health and talc on baby bottoms, a lot of Medical products now are being changed from talc to cornstarch, I believe. Baby is surprised by that. Ladies are still using talc, however. Take a look. Wait, we aren't. This is mineral free. The talc on talc, no talc. But look at other types of makeup and you will find talc in there. I will show you pictures later on. Number two on most scale, gypsum. These are crystals of gypsum. Gypsum is an evaporite. Here's a mine of gypsum. We tend to make gypsum into this kind of thing. Wallboard. And then this. Those of you who have broken bones might have had gypsum applied to your body. Although now we're using, I think, more of a polymer. This was the old school one. We mold it into decorations for buildings. Gypsum in this form is called plaster of Paris. Why? Well, Montmartre in Paris, a place that I wanted to go but didn't get because I realized that I was heading out there on the metro one night that the metro stops running. So I had to turn around and come back. They used to mine gypsum here in Paris. So it was the plaster from Paris into which we made these and these. It also occurs in crossword puzzles. Drywall mineral. Number three on hard on the hardness scale. Sorry, I cut this off here. This is calcite calcium carbonate. Um, if we heat this up, we drive off CO2, and that leaves Ca and O. I have no idea why I put that there. Oh, lime is calcite minus CO2. And uh, we use calcite in tums, in cement, in toothpaste, in Ajax. Nice thing about calcite, if you get a clean piece called Iceland Spar, it has double refraction. You can see through it and see images twice. Here's calcite. Calcite reacts with the dilute hydrochloric acid. It's the only mineral that does that, except for aragonite and dolomite, but they don't do it as well as calcite. Calcite in nice crystal form has these little cubes that aren't quite cubic. If you've ever gotten a refrigerator box as a kid and played with it, your favorite toy, after a few hours, your refrigerator box no longer had corners that were 90 degrees. 
it was probably more like this, triclinic we call it, leaning in three directions, but still a nice crystal. Here are Tums. Let's take a look at the ingredients. Sucrose, yum. Calcium carbonate, guess what? You're eating minerals. And you're also eating cornstarch and talc. Mineral oil. Mmm. We use calcite to extract sulfur from burning coal. This was one of the, I don't know if it's a four corner plant or not. I was just talking with one of the engineers for APS. They can't wait to shut these things down. Everybody's going crazy saying the president's shutting down coal. APS doesn't want to burn coal. It is a pain in the behind. You have to have trains bring it in. You have to clean up this. You have to store the waste. It takes a huge amount of manpower to keep these plants operating. Gas is a lot easier. And you can ramp up and down a gas plant a lot faster than you can a coal plant. These are not making financial sense anymore. Lime from calcium carbonate. Once you heat up, up calcium carbonate, it drives off the CO2. That leaves lime. The Native Americans figured out, down in Mexico, figured out that if you add the lime to your corn, you will get the niacin free, and that will keep you from getting pellagra. They started sending corn to the old world. People would eat the corn, at least the poor people would, but they didn't treat it with the lime because they thought that was silly. Well, they ended up getting this skin disease called pellagra. If you look on the side of any tortillas now, you will notice corn and trace of lime, which is calcium oxide. It prevents us from looking like that, although that really is how I look right now. If we heat up calcite, otherwise known as limestone, we can drive off the carbon dioxide. That leaves lime. We put it into this stuff. We mix it with water. It combines back with carbon dioxide again and creates essentially cement. Blocks are made of the same thing. Comet and the soft Ajax now are made of calcium carbonate. Fluoride is used in making glass and flux. It also is also used in making hydrofluoric acid. Don't stick your fingers in hydrofluoric acid. It kind of messes them up. Man, I'm showing you a lot of skin problems. Appetite is used in a fertilizer. This is an important thing because we are using up our good supplies of appetite. This could be a problem in the future. But we've got money coming in now. We really don't care. Feldspar. This is potassium aluminum silicate, pretty one, nice and pink. It was the scrub that made Bon Ami. It was called uh, something's friend, your kitchen's friend or the barkeeper's friend, because it was softer than the original Ajax and the original Comet. I'll talk to you about that when we get to number six. Sorry, number seven. Here is feldspar, here is feldspar. There are different kinds. We grind up feldspar, we heat it up, we put it on the outside of ceramics, we fire it, and it makes this nice glaze. Our dishes are often covered with feldspar. Our food sees feldspar before it goes into our body. Our best bathtubs, I don't have one of these, I'd love to have one, are coated with porcelain, which is feldspar. Really nice tiles that are porcelain are made of feldspar that's been stained. And, as I just told you, food sees feldspar on the way into our body, and it also sees feldspar on the way out of our body. There. Porcelain. Porcelain. In the country where I am right now, porcelain on the insulators of the high tension lines. A lot of the mineral roof materials are just ground up rock to a large degree feldspar. Porcelain weathers into clay, sorry, feldspar weathers into clay. People go out and gather the clay and then we make it into well, clay pots, which we sell at Home Depot and Lowe's and then they fall apart in a year or two because clay likes the water, it rehydrates. Number seven, quartz. The hardest common mineral. Silicon dioxide. We make it into glass. The old Ajax and the old Comet were made of ground up quartz. 
Why would this clean feldspar? We'll take a look. Hardness of 7. Go back to feldspar. Hardness of 6. When we scrubbed the old bathtub like at Grandma's house, you might have noticed around the drain, the feldspar was actually worn away. Why? Because hardness 7 was scrubbing hardness number 6. It wasn't taking just the grime, it was actually taking the feldspar away. The manufacturers of the scrubs realized this and then came up with the scrub called Bonami, which is feldspar, the same hardness as the tubs, the toilet bowls, the dishes, and things like that. But then they realized, hey, this is getting expensive. Let's go with something a little bit more common. And they decided to start making scrubs out of number three on most scale, calcite. And it might say what it's made of in here somewhere. You guys can pause and look for it. I don't want to do it now because there's too much talking here going on. It's me. I've heard me enough. You guys know quartz is this. Go to beaches, most of it is sand. There will be other stuff. And there are beaches made of calcium carbonate. There are beaches made of olivine. There's one in Hawaii. Uh, this is your typical quartz crystal. It will have six sides. It has a vitreous luster or glassy luster. Here we are making glass, bulbs. Another good use for glass. At Sprouts, they sell water that contains silica, another name for silicon dioxide. Small amounts of quartz can dissolve in water, very little. And because it Sprouts, hippie dudes go in there and buy it for almost $20. Silica, a silicon dioxide, incredibly small amounts of it dissolved in water, but you can buy it for $20. Or you could just go home and drink it out of your tap and get the same thing. Crazy. Why do I know this? Believe it or not, for a while I worked at Sprouts. I just wanted to get out and do something different. I did. For some reason they stuck me in the vitamin department. Through this semester I will tell you a lot more stories about that. Here's a bathtub cut from a single piece of quartz. Not mine. Too expensive. Here is quartz with some nice little crystals of something on it. I'm guessing this is pyrite. We already saw that. Toothpaste often have silica in them. Uh, hydrated silica. Now hydrated silica becomes softer than number seven on most scale. Here are different silicas. You join them with waters and you get hydrated silicas. The old pearl drops toothpaste had silica in it and it had a very hard form of silica. Those of you who are old like me will know about this. It didn't just take off the dirt from your teeth, it took off the enamel from your teeth. There's a reason they no longer sell it. And here is quartz, crystal in some watches. I wasn't really doing it at 6.45 p.m., but if I show you that I was doing it at 1.45 a.m., you'd make fun of me. Wait, I should have a picture of a watch in here. Um, you take a little teeny piece of quartz, you run a small electric current through it and it will vibrate, I don't know, 1,673 times a second. You have a little computer in your watch, it counts up to 1,600 whatever times a second and it moves the second hand one second. And it does that again and again. Once we got computer chips, we could come up with quartz watches. It doesn't take much electricity to make the quartz crystal vibrate. By the way, you can squish the quartz crystal and get electricity out of it backwards. Where do we use that? You guys may do this. Have you ever pushed a little red button and got a spark out of it? The igniter in your gas stove or your barbecue? That contains a quartz crystal. It's the piezoelectric effect. You're sque squeezing a piece of quartz and generating an electrostatic shock, which then ignites the propane, whatever fuel you're using. We're starting to get into the harder and less common minerals. You don't see these on your way to school. You don't get them stuck in your tires. If you do, let me know because I want to live in your neighborhood. This is topaz, hardness number eight. We start using these crystals as the pivot points in watches because they don't wear down very quickly. Here is corundum, which is an aluminum oxide. If it has titanium and iron, we call it sapphire. If it has, oh, that irritates me. Chromium, we call it ruby. Uh, here is a diamond. If you bring some to class and donate them, it's extra credit. Uh, silicon carbide, which is formed inside the big drums in which steel is made, also known as moissanite, is about a 9.5. It's synthetic, so it's not really a mineral, but I just thought I'd throw it in here. I will show you a really nice piece of moissanite.
the best watches sapphire on your iPhone and probably the Android phones too I don't know but not the cheap Huawei phones here in China and the glass here are all artificial sapphire why aren't they glass think what would happen if you dragged can after can jar after jar across the scanner it would scratch the early phones didn't have the sapphire glass now these are synthetic so they don't really count as minerals but they're essentially imitating this kind of thing and putting in the thin sheets so these guys don't scratch. This is a nice little article on how it's made. Here are synthetic diamonds which are made from people. Somebody came up with a good idea to take your carbon, squish it, and make it into diamonds. There's a little bit of boron in you so it ends up making a blue diamond. <laughs> I don't know. And this is the old joke. You take two pieces of graphite. Father's been under a lot of pressure. You get diamond. Or you just get Superman and he squishes it in, hands, in his hands for a few seconds and he makes diamond. Where are diamonds really made? In subduction zones where ocean plates go underneath continental plates. It's very slow. It takes about 1 to 3.3 billion years to form. There's a diamond stability zone down here. If we could drill down deep, send one of you down here to dig this up, you could bring back diamonds. And there are places where you have deep source eruptions that come to the surface fairly quickly without hardening, and then you can get diamonds brought to the surface this way. This is what we're mining in Australia and in the Kimberlite Formation in South Africa. Two more places you can get meteorites, sorry, uh, diamonds forming, meteorite and asteroid impacts. Not so common. Everybody thinks this is where diamonds get used the most. It's not. They're pretty, but the place most diamonds get used is here. Diamond saw blade. Why? It wears down everything else. Now you're going to notice something about the price of this. $129. Why do that when you can go to Harbor Freight and get a different kind of saw blade for $9.99? This thing will last forever. In my uh, crosscut saw, whatever that thing is called, I was going through blade after blade after blade from Harbor Freight, buying the cheap silica carbides type stuff. I finally broke down and got a diamond blade. Oh, it is nice. Any of you who have cut with a diamond blade will appreciate it. No, I didn't pay this much. Geologists have an affinity for this kind of thing. These are drill bits. They should be turned upside down because we don't drill this way unless, of course, you're in Antarctica and everybody's upside down there. Uh, this is how we drill for oil, drill for water, drill for other things. These are drill bits. Here are diamond drill bits. I used to have a good picture of a diamond drill bit going into a tooth, a human tooth. Really cool photo. I can't find it. If you can't afford the diamond saws, silicon carbide, like moissanite, is a lot softer and also a lot cheaper. The hardest minerals, we always think that's diamond. Well, that's the hardest for a long time, but there are a few harder ones. They're not that common. You can look at this later if you want. Again, here are reference tests for hardness. Thought I'd throw this in here. Nobody ever considers what the number two is on the pencil. It's on the Mohs scale. Talc gypsum. This has the same hardness as gypsum. If you've ever used a number three pencil, the graphite is extremely hard and it barely leaves a line on your paper. If you've ever used a number one, it's a lot softer. It wears off on the paper really easily. We also make graphite into lubricants because the graphite comes off in thin sheets. I just thought I'd throw this in because it's getting really boring. Here's what your friends think you do in geology. Cute. Here's what your family thinks you do. Here's what you think you do. And here's what you really do. Wake up, guys. Now, the Mohs scale, I think it was cool. I was at Panda Express one day. No, I haven't eaten there since I've been in China. Somehow, Panda Express is no longer good. I don't know how I used to like this stuff, but I did for a while. But Panda Express has these fortune cookies, which don't appear in China, by the way. 
And I looked at my fortune one day, and the first word in the fortune was Mo's from Mo's scale. Look at this right there, Mo's. That is just so cool. Crystal shape. We can use crystal shape to look at, whoops, we can use cleavage to look at minerals. There are some minerals that cleave in one direction. They peel off in sheets. Uh, I'll have to show you a picture of what one of my students in China did. He was looking at mica, and he accidentally named it talc. And he, not writing English that well, wrote down thin, S H. I T for sheet. It's so cute. I didn't have the heart to say anything. I just said, good job. How oh, my Chinese is really bad. Here is two directions of cleavage, in this case at right angles, and in this case acute or obtuse angles. Here are cubic three-directional cleavage, and here is triclinic three-directional cleavage. We can start looking at the crystal structure of minerals by using x-ray beams. We won't do that in class. Crystal shapes. Galena has cubes. We're not going to go into this. By the way, this is bismuth. It is synthetic. It's beautiful, but it's not really a mineral. I've got some of this. I love this stuff. This is not talking about Hollywood. Minerals cleave. They split along clear lines. Biotite mica tends to split along a thin line. It peels off in sheets. Here's muscovite mica, same thing. We use those thin sheets, we grind them up, and we put them in makeup. Take a look. Mica. Keep looking through here. Titanium dioxide. Mind. Zinc chloride. Mind. Kind of crazy what people put on their face. I think you could save a lot of money if you go into your backyard, dig a little hole in the dirt, stick your face in there, and go. <laughs> Might be better for you. I don't know. By the way, we used to make countertops out of mica. They're really good countertops because it is resistant to heat. The only problem is it's not very common. Early windows were made out of sheets of mica. It would let light through, but you couldn't see through it very well. We then decided to start making that kind of stuff out of plastic, so it was called formed mica, which we shortened to form mica. It was used in toasters because it was heat resistant. Again, here's makeup, talc, mica, and mineral oil. No geology, no makeup. Uh, sheets of mica, five meters by three meters, have been found in this place in mica, or sorry, in uh, Nilor, India. And those of you who watch that old timey TV station, I forget what it's called, will know why I stuck this guy's picture in there. When I get back on Tuesday, let me know if you figured out why his picture is in there. It has something to do with a rifleman. Minerals will tend to cleave if their molecules or atoms lined up consistently in the same direction. You can get salt to split along the same faces that make the crystals. There is salt, been stained a little bit. Calcite, you can split it again and again and again along these same faces. It cleaves or it splits. Some minerals or rocks don't cleave very well. They just fracture. This, in, in this case, this is a rock called obsidian, which is naturally occurring glass. occurs where basaltic lava cools down really quickly and contains a lot of silica. It creates naturally occurring glass. The Native Americans like to use this and make it to make it into spear points, arrowheads. Another way to test minerals, specific gravity, also known as density. Specific gravity is weight per unit volume. Specific gravity is, sorry, this is mass per unit volume. Density is weight per unit volume. They're close to the same thing, but not really. It works on Earth, but nowhere else. Uh, here are some sample density. Styrofoam is 0.075 grams per cubic centimeter. Water is one gram per cubic centimeter. Anything that's slightly more than one gram per cubic centimeter in density will sink. I am slightly more than one gram per cubic centimeter. I don't float. Uh, women, you'll be glad to know that, to no surprise, you are slightly less dense than water, and guys are obviously more dense. Uh, most guys are about 0.98 or 0.975 or something like that. Women tend to be, I think, a little bit less dense than that, which is why you float so well in water. I'll leave it to you to figure out why. 
uh, granite 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter basalt 3.0 grams per cubic centimeter this is important continents tend to be made out of this ocean bottoms tend to be made out of this yes I know these are rocks and I'm throwing them in here on minerals but I thought I'd share this anyway people think the continents will sink into the oceans and plunge beneath the earth no no more than styrofoam is going to sink underneath water that's not going to happen Diamonds are pretty dense. They are 3.5 grams per cubic centimeter. Get a big one, drop it in your swimming pool, and you'll see it goes to the bottom really quickly. Probably not a good idea to do. Iron is about 7.8 grams per cubic centimeter. Lead, 11.34 grams per cubic centimeter. Gold is 18, sorry, uranium is 18.8 .8 grams per cubic centimeter and gold 19.32 grams per cubic centimeter this is important because every once in a while you'll see a movie like the Italian job where they will fill up a is it a Cooper or a mini with uh, gold they'll go driving around the streets of some Italian city like there's styrofoam in the back of it that wouldn't happen that amount of gold would be incredibly heavy slash massive um, and then I think they dropped the gold through the floorboard of the car into water and then they just moved it through the water with no problem. You also see people in westerns filling up their saddlebags with gold, running their horse to the edge of the cliff, jumping off the cliff with their saddlebags, swimming across the stream, and then running to safety, rich, and retiring with a beautiful star. It doesn't happen. Gold is way too dense. I have held depleted uranium. A sheet of it. It felt like somebody was pulling down on it while I was holding it. Just crazy. DE or DU is used in shells in military conflicts. Another special test, magnetism. Naturally occurring magnetic material is called magnetite or lodestone. It is iron and oxygen. The ancients used to get a piece of this, float it on wood, and it was the first compass. The acid test. Uh, I was going to show you the video, but as we know, it's not working very well, but we will do this in class. Take dilute hydrochloric acid, the same thing that's in your stomach. No, don't take it out of your stomach. We'll have some in class. Put it on a rock that you think contains calcite. If it does indeed contain calcite, the rock will effervesce or, to use a fifth grade word, bubble or fizzle. Calcite has double refraction. Ulexite has this neat characteristic of being a natural fiber optic mineral. Any print that's on the bottom of it will be projected through to the top. I have never found a piece of this. We had a piece here at the college campus once, but I have no idea where it is. Some minerals will glow under fluorescent light. Some will glow once you put a light on them and then turn the light off. Feldspar, K feldspar, is identified by striations. Other weird tests, ooh, ooh. Sorry, this is off to the side, bugging me. Let me straighten it out. Let's see if that's better. Sulfur smells like a match or gunpowder. Uh, if you heat it or strike it, it'll smell like rotten eggs. Sulfides like pyrite or galena smell a little like sulfur, at least to people with really good noses, big ones like me. Um, native arsenic smells a little bit like garlic. I have never really smelled it, so I can't attest to the truth of this. And if you heat it, it'll give off strong garlic, but I wouldn't do that because it contains arsenic. It's toxic. Oh, man, missing the period. Kaolinite, since it's made of clay, when you get it wet, it smells like clay. Duh. Here we have ductility and malleability. That hard word to say again. There are some minerals that are radioactive. The most common three are these. If you remind me, I will pull out my little radiation meter when I get back and show you some uranium or carnotite that I picked up north of Cameron, Arizona. And this again shows the squeezing of the quartz crystal, but since I can't use YouTube, I don't think, we're going to skip it. Uh, some minerals have fibers in them. In the case around Kingman, they dumped a lot of asbestos outset, out there, so these people riding mountain bikes and motorcycles on it are breathing a lot of asbestos. Halite, rock salt, is easily tested by taste. And invariably, I have students taste the halite every year. There was an analysis done here at, uh, was it UT? Troy, somewhere. And it was presented at uh, 
the GSA meeting, Geological Society of America meeting in 2014 in Vancouver. And they tested. It appears that uh, you can transmit some bacteria, but it's not significant, the risk. Here is how minerals are used in life. Uh, you can look up this poster on the web. They're all over. Here's where the minerals are. This is what I was talking about. Don't use a glass cutting board with your nice knives. Here's a nice little piece of quartz out at Cave Creek. You might want to buy this and then donate it to the campus. That would be cool. Here's another piece in the same area. Here's some nice quartz with the stains in it, amethyst. Here is, I think this is azurite at the same place. Uh, let's see. Here are several sentences that all contain 10 words and they help you memorize Mohs skill. The great carpet faded and Frank questioned the carpet's durability was invented by a student named John Benjamin. And this is the way I remember that feldspar is pink. It's a nice little poem. I like my house's kitchen. It has a real big sink. The sink is made of porcelain and the porcelain comes from feldspar. If you notice, sink and feldspar rhyme very... No, they don't. But it's still a poem. If you get calcite on your faucets, all you have to do is get some vinegar and acid, soak the faucet or the shower head, and it will become clean overnight. Here's just an ADHD moment. What is this? What are these? You can pause because I'm going to the next slide. It's bedtime here in China. Zoom in. We're looking at that. Oops. These are wind turbines in the Thames estuary, making enough electricity to supply 500,000 homes. There's my old watch I sold on eBay. Here's the Moskill. There's Galena. Uh, a few more minerals. You'll see this one in granite. An ore is a rock that has enough of a mineral to make taking that ore out of the ground economically viable. Iron tends to make rocks heavy and often red. Here's non-rusted hematite. Here's more rusty hematite, now called limonite. We make iron into this kind of stuff. Lead ore, gold. I think I am going to stop here because we can show you this next time. That's it. I can make sure. Yeah, I'll show you this stuff next week. That's enough for now. Thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you later. Tuesday. Ciao, and good night.